What does the Statue of Liberty, the proto-Indo-European creation myth, Feronia, and the Lupercalia have to do with each other? Let's find out. We will start our journey here with the Lupercalia and the connections to an ancient warrior band known as the Chorios. Before diving deeper into the more obscure figure of Feronia and her connections to Proto-Indo-European mythology. On the map here you can see what other traditions the Proto-Indo-European Chorios are also connected to. But within this specific episode we're going to go deep into the Lupercalia and its connections and its ancient origins. When it comes to the Lupercalia, some people think of it being the ancient origins of Valentine's Day. Though there is much more to the Lupercalia than meets the eye. In this video, we will do a deep dive into the fascinating archaic history of this ritualistic practice tracing it back to its original roots. The Lupercal, named after the Latin word lupa, meaning female wolf, was a cave situated at the southwest base of Rome's Palatine Hill. According to the legendary founding tale of Rome, the twin brothers Romulus and Remus were discovered in the cave and nursed by a she-wolf until the shepherd Faustulus rescued them. The Luperci, priests of the rustic god Faunus, performed rituals associated with the Lupercalia festival at this cave, a tradition that persisted from the early days of the city until at least 494 AD. The Roman Senate considered the Lupercalia crucial for the safety and well-being of Rome. In the ancient Roman religious and mythological context, Faunus was revered as the god of the forest, plains and fields, and when he bestowed fertility upon cattle, he was known as Inus. The name Faunus is linked to the Latin term lupus, wolf, reflecting the fact that the Luperci, often regarded as temporary priests of Faunus, were known as wolfmen. The term Lupercalia was thought to be also connected to the ancient Greek festival of the Arcadian Lycia, a celebration associated with wolves. While the festival's name likely stems from lupus, meaning wolf, the exact etymology and significance remain unclear. The association with wolves may be related to the symbolic role of a predatory animal in male rites of passage. The Lupercalia boasted its own priesthood, the Luperci, or Brothers of the Wolf, whose establishment and rights were attributed either to the Arcadian culture hero Evander or to the shepherd twins Romulus and Remus. The Luperci were typically young men, usually aged between 20 and 30 years old. Something that is of note also here is the concept of the Proto-Indo-European Chorios. This is referring to bands of young warriors with a dual role, both living within and apart from society, which is also particularly relevant here. This goes back to around 3300 to 2600 BC, so within the Neolithic. And during certain periods, these groups would venture into the wilderness to hunt and raid other communities, while in the remaining time, they were tasked with defending their own community. They were guided by a senior male and lived off the country by hunting and engaging in raiding and pillaging foreign communities. A defining aspect of these young men's communities was the initiation ritual, which involved living outside the norms of society, often in stark contrast to its values. The Chorios were composed of adolescent males, 
presumably from 12, 13 up to 18, 19 years of age, usually coming from prominent families and initiated together into manhood as an age class cohort. After undergoing painful trials to enter the group, they were sent away to live as landless warriors in the wild for up to nine years, within a group ranging from two to twelve members. The young males went without possession other than their weapons, living on the edges of their host society. The Koryos were seen also as being closely connected to the gods, especially thunder gods, and were believed to possess supernatural powers and abilities. Additionally, these warrior bands were closely tied to specific animals, particularly dogs and wolves. Wolves and dogs were regarded as mystical symbols representing death, lawlessness, promiscuity and the fury of warriors. And the association with these animals signified a state of liminality between invulnerability and death, as well as between youth and adulthood. And uh, Koyos also having been linked to dog and cattle sacrifice as well, which has been strongly established in the field. Yet, for instance, the midwinter dog sacrifices connected to the winter solstice. But if you were now listening to this, you're probably wondering, like, didn't just say 12 to, let's say, 19 years of age. And yes, that is exactly true. That is the ritual and the rite of passage where they would be going out into the wilderness to be a part of society, to be away from, from this, yeah, the society and the community. However, there's another ritual. This was a death and rebirth ritual connected to the ancestors and purification. And this was linked to the return of the Chorus warrior band into the community, in which the young men either dress up as their ancestors, or have otherwise a connection to both their ancestors and the underworld after roaming through the village, where they become, through this final ritual after the Chorus spirit ended, part of the tribe and eligible for marriage. So in that sense, it's not the Chorus ritual in the sense of going out into the wild, into into the wilderness, yes. But very much about returning back into the community to, to settle in. But now coming back to ancient Rome. Uh, the Lupercalia, also known as Lupercal, was an ancient you know, pastoral festival in Rome. Observed annually to purify the city and promote health and fertility. In the Roman calendar, February marked a month of universal purification and the beginning of the new year. And then on February 15th, the Lupercalia festival took place, involving Juno as Juno Lucina, associated with purification and fertility. So Juno Lucina, wife of the thunder god Jupiter, was very much a multifaceted deity, embodying sovereignty, martial prowess, and fertility. And a temple dedicated to Juno Lucina was erected in 375 BC in the sacred grove dedicated to the goddess from ancient times. And in that sense, the Lupercalia was intricately linked to this Juno Lucina and conducted by wolf priests. And in this ritual, the wolf priests, symbolizing ancestors, performed purification rites that connected the community with the underworld. The Lupercal cave then also served as a passage to the underworld, and the Luperci emerged from and returned to it during the ritual. Caves within Roman religious thought symbolized, you know, this kind of passage into the underworld. And symbolically, you know, the, the looper key uh, then by going into this cave journeyed from and back to the underworld, guided by Juno, who played a crucial role in rejuvenating and guiding them through the purification ritual. 
from a Jungian perspective. You know, Juno can be seen as the anima mediating the unconscious and facilitating a symbolic rebirth and revitalization of the individual. At the Lupercal altar, a male goat or goats and a dog were sacrificed by one of the Luperci, supervised by the Flamian Dialis, Jupiter's chief priest. Salted milk cakes prepared by the Vestal Virgins were also offered. Following this blood sacrifice, two Luperci approached the altar, there, you know, where their foreheads would be anointed with blood and then cleansed with wool soaked in milk. Where the ritual required that the two young men would laugh. The sacrificial feast would then ensue, feasting on the meat, after which the Luperci cut tongs, called febra, from the flayed animal skin and ran, naked or nearly so, along the old Palatine boundary in an anti-clockwise direction. And this fertility rite involved the goatskin-clad Luperci striking women who sought to conceive. The ancient Herpi Sorani cult translating to Wolves of Soranus from Sabine Herpers, meaning wolf, held its rituals on Mount Soracte, located 45 kilometers north of Rome. And this cult shared similarities with the Roman Lupercalia. Although some say it derived from this more archaic cult, it is also possible that the Lupercalia did not directly derive from the Herpi Sarani, but rather shared a common ancestry in the Chorios rituals. Much like the Herpi Sarani, the priests participating in the Lupercalia belonged to specific families. These priests were organized into two collegia, the Fabiani and the Quintiliani, named after the prominent patrician families of Fabi and Quintili. In the Lupercalia, akin to the practices of the Herpi Sarani, the wolf priest symbolizing ancestors played a role in purifying the community by establishing a connection with the underworld. And the act of purification involved rituals and rites carried out by these priests, echoing the ancient traditions that linked both the Lubrocalia and the Herpi Sarani to a shared cultural and religious tradition. This cult is connected to Feronia, a more obscure figure, believed to have originated from the Sabine culture. Feronia holds sway over various domains, serving as a deity associated with the underworld, wilderness, fertility, springs, water, nature's vital forces, health and abundance. Feronia was also a Trion goddess, mother, virgin and elderly woman associated with the three worlds, earth, underworld and sky. Notably, an archaic cult recognized her as Juno the Virgin, where she was paired with a young Jupiter, according to Servius, predating Roman Juno, both linked to a thunder god. The sacred significance of woods and springs further emphasized her influence, and as a harvest goddess, Feronia receives reverence through offerings of the wild fruits uh, that are harvested. Fronia also played a crucial role in conferring civil rights upon the people of her tribe and protecting the outcast, establishing her as a sovereign within her designated realms. And this giving of rights also then made her a figure that guided both outcasts, those living in the wilderness, and later also freed man back into society in this part of the tribe. Varro identified Feronia with Libertas, the goddess who personified liberty. The name Libertas, freedom, is a derivation from Latin liber, free, stemming from a Proto-Indo-European word meaning belonging to the people. Libertas was associated with the Phrygian capital, so 
and Feronia in that sense can be seen as an earlier manifestation of this later Libertas. But when it comes to, you know, this Phrygian cap among the Romans, the cap of felt uh, was seen as the emblem of liberty. And uh, goddess Libertas is also depicted, you know, within more modern uh, depictions as Lady Liberty. And also depicted within France during the French Revolution. Symbolizing, you know, within these more modern times, the liberty, equality, fraternity, and reason. Something that, you know, coincidentally makes sense regarding Feronia's symbolism and her Corio's connection. It is then also very interesting that, you know, Feronia, who then welcomed people into the tribe, did that where Lady Liberty is what people see when entering the United States. You know, and this very much echoes the role of Feronia and guiding, you know, outcasts and those outside of the tribe and integrate them into the tribe. Juno, who is connected to Feronia, was also associated with uh, Curitus and is also with Curinus. In the admission into the Curia, so that means the assembly of the tribe. Uh, you know, a function Feronia that's also played in this return was not just a physical reintegration, but also a psychological and spiritual one. And it marked the transition from a liminal state to being fully recognized and accepted within the tribe. And from a union lens, you know, the, the role of these goddesses can be seen as. A psychological metaphor for the integration of marginalized aspects of the psyche. As I had said, Romulus and Remus were connected to the you know cave within the Lupercalia, next to the she wolf. Regarding that, but also with Feronia and Juno, there is much more going on from a proto Indo European lens than one might think. First I want to go into the symbolism regarding Feronia and Juno before, you know, uh, heading into Romulus and Remus. So firstly, with Feronia, she had a son, Erelus, who has a Greek counterpart in Gerion, both of which who had a triple hat and a triple soul. You know, Geryon having one body and three heads. Being a reflex of the three-headed serpent stealing the cattle. In proto in the european myth, where Heracles, who is connected to the myth of Geryon, who by scholars is seen as Trito, so you know, Heracles is seen as Trito, retrieves the cattle of Geryon, echoing the Trito myth and the three-headed serpent slaying myth. Juno's cult also included the annual feeding of a sacred snake with barley cakes by virgin maidens. You know, the, the snake dwelt in a deep cave within the precinct of the temple. Connecting especially Feronia, not only to serpents, but in this case also to the Trito myth, where with Juno there is a snake, so serpent connection. Something that Apollo also is connected to with slaying of the serpent, you know, to give an example. If you want to know more regarding Trito, I have a episode up on Patreon called From Trito to the Wild Hunt, if you're interested in that. And all of this is also something that I go much deeper into within my upcoming book, Alchemy of the Psyche, where I do a much deeper dive into the Proto-Indo-European Sovereignty Goddess, Wife of the Thunder God, linked to figures such as Feronia, the Morrigan, and Holda. These figures all having both a connection to cattle and the Koryos, 
next to a connection to stealing of cattle, often a serpent being involved. But when it now comes to Trito himself, Trito is a reconstructed proto-Indo-European figure who embodies the heroic ideals of courage, strength and the pursuit of cosmic balance. And he is connected to the figures of Manu and Yemo. Manu being the ancestors of man and humanity and Yemo being his twin brother who is sometimes a hermaphrodite and who is sacrificed. So in that sense Manu, you know, sacrifices Yemo to the Sky Father and the gods show their approval by giving cattle to Trito. Trito meaning the third. And the following myth that I'm gonna tell regarding Trito is one in which the sovereignty goddess that I've reconstructed within my book is included within. So this is a deviation from the more wider known Trito myth. And basically goes after Manu had taught humanity the sacred art of sacrifice. The people in their short-sightedness neglected this divine practice. The sovereignty goddess witnessed this transgression with her sorrowful eyes. In response, she invoked the ancient serpent, a creature intimately tied to her. The serpent slithered through the cosmic realms, stealthily approaching the pastures where the sacred cattle grazed. In a swift and covert move, the serpent stole the cattle, spiriting them away from the mortal realm. The once lush pastures now lay barren, a testament to the consequences of neglecting the sacred bond between gods and mortals. The snake, you know, being typically depicted as a powerful adversary symbolizing chaos, danger or malevolence. Despite an initial setback, Trito gains strength from an intoxicating drink and receives assistance from the storm god. Together they venture into a cave or mountain where the hero triumphs over the serpent and returns the recovered cattle to a priest for a proper sacrifice dedicated to the storm god and possibly also the sovereignty goddess, thus reaffirming the connection to the gods and bringing back order to the cosmos, thus reaffirming the initial sacrifice regarding, you know, Yemo. A further interesting thing also is that Juno and Feronia are both connected to cattle, and Juno receiving cattle as sacrifice. And this kind of mythological link can then also further be seen by the run into the cave with uh, Lupercali and the ritual at Mount Soracta we will go into later. Romulus and Curinus being in the older sense Manu, where Ramos, the twin brother who is sacrificed, is Yemo, which is reconstructed based on the etymology of their names. Now, when it comes to this particular myth that is before the Trito myth, it starts with Manu and his giant twin Yemo and the primordial cow, who are born from the primordial state of the universe. And in their quest to create the world, Manu performs a solemn sacrifice, offering his brother's life, while assisted by heavenly deities like the Sky Father, the Storm God, and the Divine Twins. And from Yemo's remains, both the natural elements and human beings are forged. Manu cuts Yemo's body into pieces, and from this he created the world, the sun, the moon, the ocean, and the stars. So Manu's act of you know, sacrifice establishes him as the first priest, laying the foundation for the world order and teaching people how to sacrifice. 
And this act of sacrifice is then also echoed in both the Lupercalia and on Mount Soracte, reaffirming the initial sacrifice of Manu. You know, and, 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 and in that sense, with Rome connecting it to the death of Remus, and, you know, the foundation and the establishment of Rome itself. Then finally, you know, when it comes to the primeval cow, well, there are some discrepancies between European and Indo-Iranian versions, but it's, it is believed that the primeval cow was likely sacrificed in the original myth, giving birth to other animals and vegetables. And Yemo's destiny may have led him to become the king of the underworld, the realm of the deceased, being the first mortal to perish in the primordial sacrifice. There also something to point out is that you know with Thor we can see that instead of a cow or cattle, instead goats were sacrificed. Which is interesting. So you know, and he's connected to Trito. So it is possible that the the goat symbolism with the Lubercalia could be connected to that, but you know it's it's very unsure. So, but you know, generally in ancient cultures, you know, these rituals played a significant role in establishing connections between humans and the divine. In the case of the Proto-Indo-Europeans, the cow and cattle playing an important role. You know, in looking at the significance of this myth within the Proto-Indo-European context, the statement made by the Roman Senate that the Lubercalia was essential to Rome's safety and well-being is getting an even deeper significance, you know, because, like I said, Romulus and Remus are intimately tied to the creation of Rome. So this continuation of this ritual is in that sense literally bringing a, it's it's a literally a revitalization of Rome itself bringing you know rejuvenation like what Juno's name also means rejuvenation and in that sense also spread this you know this sense of fertility and rejuvenation uh, into Rome itself the most interesting connection regarding Feronia to come back to her is the one she has with Apollo of Mount Soranos, whose worship strongly resembled that of Feronia. His priests were known as Herpi Sorani, like I said, meaning the wolves of Soranos. In the literary text of the time, he is usually called Apollo without any epithet. And uh, Herpi Sorani had a distinctive wolf cult marked by a myth where during a sacrifice dedicated to Apollo Soranus, Wolf seized the entrails of the offerings from the altar. Pursuing these wolves, shepherds reached the cave, the toxic fumes of which triggered a pestilence among them. And in response to this crisis, an oracle directed them to adopt a wolf-like lifestyle, meaning living by plundering, providing an intriguing you know, origin for the wolf cult associated with Apollo. You know, which became their way of explaining the ancient and archaic rituals that most likely derive from the ancient Proto-Indo-European Chorios. The wolf was for them also considered to be a sacred animal connected to both Apollo and Feronia. In addition, on some Etruscan urns, there is a wolf-like demon emerging from a well, which might also signify a passage to the world of the dead. You know, like I said, caves play an essential role in Catonic cults, especially within you know the Roman context. And the priest could pass to the world of the dead either through a cave or a well, or symbolically through fire, as the Herpi Sarani did. The most probable origin of Apollo there dates back to a primordial cult of the sun, which on special dates was seen rising and setting behind this particular sacred mountain. And uh, places 
of Apollo and Feronia were often, you know, important oracular sites as well. In fact, on the eastern slopes of the mountain, there were deep wells from which even today large condensation mists emerge, which many Roman authors, such as Servius, describe as vapors typically of the cult of Apollo. And it seems that the slight intoxication of the priests or priestesses allowed them to enter a trance state and speak through the mouth of these deities. In an ancient times, you know, these warriors and priests and also held ritual feasts on a mountain whilst burning fires and giving offerings. The purification process here was represented through the radiant embers and the priest's miraculous passage across them unharmed. And this purification was facilitated by the forces originating from the underworld. In that sense, the Hirpi Sarani priests, symbolizing wolves, traverse the fire, symbolically journeying to the realm of death and returning. In doing so, they conducted a purifying ritual that extended its effects to the entire community. They lit a lot of pine wood and expanded the burning embers by walking on it barefoot without feeling pain three times, jumping on the embers as if in a dance, and in this way carrying the meat, the gifts and sacrificial offerings up to the altar of Apollo in a complex ritual that took place at the winter solstice. And Feronia would oversee this ritual, which was also symbolically connected to the underworld. And there were also annual festivities in honor of both Apollo and Feronia that took place at the base of the mountain at the temple of Feronia and her sacred grove. If we look at this from a union lens, we can see you know, that Feronia, through this death and rebirth ritual, was providing the warriors of the tribe with a space of psychological healing, where they, through the ritual, have a um, psychological space to face what comes up from the unconscious, which in the ritual is symbolized through the facing of the underworld and the return from it, echoing the hero's journey and katabasis. And from my own experience with such symbolic journeys, you now I know how within dark spaces they are potent for unconscious material to come up to be worked through. And the cavern at Mount Saracta and the Lupercali cave for Juno, for instance, who are both like other caves for the Romans a passage into the underworld serve as such a dark and symbolic space where these processes can take place, uh, which, you know, Juno and Feronia would oversee and help with the integration of the contents of the unconscious, symbolically from a Jungian lens um, being an anima figure. And in that sense, you know, the death and rebirth ritual itself is a purification ritual, you know, where the elements of the shadow are purified in a sort of alchemical psychological process and integrated into consciousness. You know, and this includes both the shadow and also the anima and animus, you know, becoming thus akin to the alchemical wedding and union of all opposites into one being, which is often after the return of the Koryos and its descendant rituals, after later celebrated in a hero's gamos type ritual. And this is the final goal of the process of union individuation, where, you know, one can say... The creation of the world and the death of Yimo can be seen as a symbolic process of dissolution of the psyche into matter. You know, this final death and rebirth ritual done within the context of the Chorios, Lupercalia and on Mount Saracta becomes the facing of the shadow and the underworld and thus the return of the initial wholeness lost to what the Orphic mystics would call the titanic dispersion into matter where unconscious psychological contents become projected into the world in an unconscious manner. And this 
death and rebirth symbolism also then connects again to both the rising and setting of the sun, you know, important to Mount Taracta, next to the link with the winter solstice. And these rituals are in that sense very archaic and within the Proto-Indo-European context, you know, also then highly important. You know, and by doing these type of rituals in this, you know, annual manner that they would do, they continuously reestablish the the connection to, to both the sacrifice made by Yimo, you know, in the, in and in the Romans case with Romulus and Remus, but also it's a facing of you know of the shadow, a facing of that and a reconnection to to that sense of wholeness. Thank you.